Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And I have a correction. Oh, no. (laughs) For real? Yeah. Oh, Megan. (laughs) Listen. (laughs) Uh, I definitely said a name wrong, and when I listened back and was editing, I was like, damn it, I know exactly what I did. So, in the first part of our Susan Smith story, I was talking about uh, Mark Kloss. Well, damn it, I just said it wrong again. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's what I said. That okay. is, So, I said okay. Mark Kloss and Polly Kloss. And it's actually class. Okay. So I just wanted to correct that, especially since she was a victim. Okay. Um, But the reason, it, and I even looked it up too prior, and the reason it got twisted in my head is because of the Wisconsin story with Jamie Kloss. Oh. Okay. So that's why, but either way, I messed it up. And also... I I had it written down and completely forgot to say on our last episode that that was episode 100, and oh. now we're on 101. Well, sweet. So we've been doing Holy the crap. thing. Holy crap. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. How did that even happen? Uh, a lot of research. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So now we can do part two and see what else I mess up for you. Mm-hmm. And that has been Corrections with Megan! Woo! <laughs> Yay! I'm gonna do it every time now. Cool. Uh, so, if anyone wants to read it, the book that I used was Sins of the Mother by Maria F. Diamatis. And... That's a cool name. It is, and I had to look up that, too. I, I like was, it. <laughs> it was not easy to figure out. <laughs> Uh, So in part one, we talked about how Susan and David Smith had two children together, Michael and Alex, but their marriage didn't work out. And Susan's attorney served David with divorce papers on September 21st, 1994. She started seeing Tom Finlay, but he broke things off because he kind of felt like Susan was just too clingy for him. Tom wrote her a letter explaining why he wanted to break things off, and he mentioned that he wasn't interested in being responsible for kids. On October 25th, Susan left work early and picked up her boys from daycare. She went for a drive that night and claimed that a black man broke into her car while she was at a stoplight and kidnapped her children. The description of the kidnapper was horrendously vague. And investigators noticed that there was a lot of inconsistencies in Susan's story, and people in town were starting to wonder if she was hiding something. Ooh. So, residents were out searching, hanging photos of the boys around town, and they tied yellow ribbons to mailboxes and telephone poles. I think that's so sweet when people do. I don't know why. I just think it's the sweetest thing ever. I love it. It is people coming together and doing something good. Yep. You know? And there's not a lot of that. No, no. I just think it's really, really cool. Yeah. They also went through the wooded areas on horseback. Susan never spent... Oh, smart. Yes. And so Susan never spent a moment alone and was always surrounded by friends and family. Every day, that same group of people would repeat the words that became their mantra. Stay hopeful, stay positive, and pray. Susan made a plea on the news to get her kids back, and she tearfully said, quote, I can't sleep, I can't eat, I can't do anything but think about them. I just want to hug them so bad and tell them I love them. On the second day of the investigation, Susan did take a lie detector test and failed. Of course she did. Right. And police accused her of staging things and being involved in the kidnapping, and she got belligerent with them, like, right away. Okay. And that's when she's getting real defensive real fast. Yeah, yeah. And so that's when the police kind of realized they weren't going to be able to intimidate her into a confession. They would have to kind of slow things down and try a different tactic. Right. On the third day of the investigation... A car matching the description of Susan's Mazda was seen in North Carolina, but it ended up not being hers. 
divers were getting ready to search John D. Long Lake, and the plan was to go from, like, the shoreline to about 100 feet out. Honest to God, I think the divers are, like, incredibly cool because I could never no. get in the water with intents of finding bodies. Yeah. Like, I don't even like... Looking into murky water because I am convinced something is coming out of there. Ooh, keep that thought in mind for later. Oh, no! Dude. <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah. No, no. I don't yeah. like that. Uh-oh. No. Oh, boy. Um, boy, are you going to be unhappy later. Great. <laughs> That's great. Well, the divers spent hours in the murky water ah! and found nothing. But... The experts made a huge mistake. Nobody considered that the driver of the car would simply let it roll into the water and drift. So they believed the car would be driven at a high speed, meaning it would drop and sink really close to the edges of the water. Right. Mm -hmm. The FBI searched Susan's home and didn't find anything. A week into the search, Susan appeared in front of the cameras again, and she said, quote, I want to say to my babies that your mama loves you so much, and your daddy, this whole family, loves you so much. And you guys have got to be strong because you are, which I just know. I just feel in my heart that you're okay, but you got to take care of each other. And your mama and daddy are going to be right here waiting on you when you get home. I wanted to, I don't even, you know, I I obviously haven't heard the end of the story, but I Pretty sure I know where this is going, so uh-huh. uh, I just want to say that that is fucking disgusting, and it absolutely disgusts me that a parent that killed their child or children could get up there and be like, oh, I love you. Like, we're here waiting. Like, no the fuck you do not. And that's the other reason, or the actual reason why I included so many of her quotes in this story. Yeah. Is because I wanted everyone to see what she was up there saying. Yeah, I hate that. That's just like, now you're pissing me off. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, Susan's neighbor, Dot Frost, which, is that not the cutest? Oh my god, that's adorable. (laughs) I just love it. That's adorable. Little Dot Frost. (laughs) Uh, She was actually one of the early skeptics in this story. She felt that Susan's tears were fake, and Dot's son, Scott, was sure. Stop it! It's Dot and Scott! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps getting better! Um, so Scott was sure that he saw Susan's car pull out of the driveway between 8.15 to 8.30 on the night of the murder, or the disappearance. Right. He was watching TV and got up during a commercial, and Scott saw Susan's car backing out of her driveway. But Susan said that she had been at Walmart for a long time shopping that night. Oh. And he told his mother that was impossible. Now, Dot had also noticed something weird that night, which is this I would never, you know, think about, but... She had been at home listening to a police scanner and heard about the carjacking. And she glanced over at Susan's house and noticed that her porch light was off. And she was like, well, that's weird because her porch light is always on. Oh, now see, I would notice that. I I, I guess I don't look at people's if, porch lights as yeah, much. Yeah, I guess it really depends on how much you watch. But like, yep, yeah, I'm totally that creepy person that knows when all of the neighbors, like, if I know which house have the lights on. And I would also be like, what is going on? Like, if, if something like this were to happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, w- I think I would for sure notice that. And so investigators took the information down, but they told Dot. They were like, do not talk to anybody. When a local reporter knocked on the door and asked if she believed Susan, she said, quote, it's like fishy. It looks suspicious. So, Oops. yeah, that's not really keeping your mouth shut. However... <laughs> Uh, That night, she got an anonymous call from somebody that said, I hope you rot in hell. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Police were interviewing Susan daily, and they started to see more inconsistencies in her story. Remember when she said, you know, that she had stopped at Walmart to do the shopping? Well, nobody at Walmart remembered seeing her with her two boys. Because she wasn't there. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. 
And Susan claimed she was going to see a friend afterwards, but the friend didn't know anything about her coming over, and they weren't even home that night. (laughs) Whoops. So that's not going to work. And the police were even like, and the house of this person was really dirty. Like, they were not expecting somebody to come over. Right, right. You know. Uh, So police told Susan, nobody saw you at Walmart. And she was like, oh, okay. So she changed her story. And she explained that she is actually, you know, she was out just driving for hours with her boys. And she made up the Walmart story because she was afraid that her story looked suspicious. Okay, well, it sure does now. Right. When the man supposedly broke into her car at the stoplight, Susan said there was no other cars at the intersection, so there couldn't have been any witnesses to this. Oh, of course. Well, funny there was. enough, no. Oh. That specific light will only turn red for the direction Susan was traveling if there is cross traffic. Oh, so, snap. That's not going to work. <laughs> Didn't think of that. Right. Well, and she's lived there forever. I mean, she knows this. The locals all know. Yeah. By day eight, Susan changed her written statement after police informed her that the story was not adding up. Wait, the, we're changing it again? Again. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the friend that Susan claimed she was going to see on the night of the murder was Mitchell Sinclair, and the media was outside of his house and calling him all day and all night, which I think is so wrong. Yep. When one reporter cornered him, Mitchell made a mistake. Oh? He said, quote, the truth will eventually come out, which doesn't seem that bad, but it made reporters think that he had something to do with the disappearance. Yep. yep. Even though the sheriff was like, no, no, no. He was shooting down the rumors and did a press conference to say, like, Mitchell's not a suspect, but it didn't work. So he showed up at the door of Reverend Cato in the middle of the night and asked if they could just pray. The Reverend got out of bed and saw a line of cars down the street. 16 members of the Smith and Russell families and several friends filed into his house and they just prayed together for 45 minutes. Holy crap. And it felt like uh, the field of dreams. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) When I was reading it. That's amazing. (laughs) At the end, Susan said they would have a celebration when her babies came home. Sheriff Wells received a call at 3.30 a.m. saying a child matching Alex's description showed up in a Seattle motel room and the car is a South Carolina vehicle. That was the closest everybody got to having any hope that the children were okay. But it wasn't Alex. Yeah. So, like, crazy, crazy coincidence on that. And the super sad one for everybody else that was actually wanting them to come back. Right. And then the doubt about Susan's story hit the front page of the Union Daily Times on Saturday, October 29th. It was reported that Susan's lie detector test had raised a lot of questions. The story pointed out all of the inconsistencies in Susan's story, and one woman who knew her said, She called her several times to offer her prayers, and Susan would end the conversations with, I'll always cherish the memories of my babies. Ew. Right, which she thought was very strange, because it is. Uh, Heather Hoops, the news reporter that was covering the story, said the people kept asking her if she thought the mom did it. She said that Susan would say things to her like, I loved them. I really did, which is obviously past tense. Yeah. And it was just making people so skeptical. During one of her early TV appearances, Susan was talking about the night where the carjacker shoved her out of the car, and she said she heard her son Michael say, quote, Mama, where are you going? And she told him, Baby, I've got to go, but you're going to be okay. And she yelled, I love y'all. And she watched as the car sped off. 
On the ninth day of the search, Susan and her husband David appeared on the National Network Morning News programs to declare their innocence, and they were pleading for the return of Michael and Alex. Susan told viewers that it hurts her to know that people even thought that she could harm her children. Oh, I'm sure it does hurt her. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you want to hear how much? No. Well, she said, quote, As a mother, it's only a natural instinct to protect your children from any harm, and the hardest part of this whole ordeal is not knowing if your children are getting what they need to survive. Hmm. You're just continuously pissing me off more and more. Yep. Now, investigators, and I really give them props for this, I do, because they tried on this case. So investigators were working on building a plan to get Susan to confess. It was a bit tricky because she has a history, though, of suicide attempts. And they were worried that if they pushed her too far, they wouldn't ever learn the truth. Oh. Yeah, so it's like a delicate line. That is definitely difficult. Mm Mm-hmm. The behavioral specialists that analyzed Susan put together a profile of a cool, cunning woman with a strong desire to succeed. Early in the investigation, Tom Finlay gave them a copy of that breakup letter that he sent to Susan, and he said that she reacted vindictively and was really bitter, and he was surprised by that reaction. And that letter, like, was so upfront and legit, like, he was like laying it right out there exactly how it needed to be. He told her exactly how he felt and moved on. And they weren't even technically dating. Right. They went on dates. Yeah. But they weren't, like, together together. And that's exactly it. Yeah. And at least he was freaking up front. Exactly. Instead of just leading her on forever. Right. The original idea that the team came up with was to do a big media blitz. Sheriff Wells did a press conference where he said, quote, I don't know that we're any closer to finding the car. I have nothing encouraging. We're following old information that we've just not gotten to. I don't think it's developed into anything as of yet to be uh, any more excited about than yesterday. Sheriff Wells talked about the abductor and said, quote, I'm waiting right now, hopefully to hear back from the abductors. I'll talk with them directly. I will go to where he is or I will go to where I can find the children. I'm open to suggestions right now, and I'm hoping he will call. This case has grown to such a degree that if this abductor has seen the amount of attention that's been placed on it, that he would be frightful of how to handle himself or what to even do or how to move right now. I mean, that's honestly not a bad point. No. And he says, we're still taking it as we did at the beginning as a random carjacking. We don't know why the subject was interested in this particular car or if it had any bearing whatsoever, why the abductor would be at this particular location, or even if he was one of our own citizens or not. We're following different scenarios. If it was a single abductor, what would be necessary to keep us from finding the vehicle and where he might be? It's very easy to believe that maybe someone else also was involved who was picked up later or someone else was waiting to be picked up or someone else assisted in hiding the car. And he says, when I say two or more people, it doesn't mean anything different than what she said that one person took the car. I wish I could tell you right now that I had something that made me more confident yeah, and had taken some of the burden off of our hearts. But as of right now... I don't have anything that gives me a great deal of relief. I can't say that anything is very promising at this time. Damn. Now, this was very calculated with his words, yeah. just so that we're on the same page yeah, here. Yeah, for sure. Um, one person that was completely hounded, though, through the whole process was Shirley McLeod. And that was the house that Susan ran to on the night of the, that the kids disappeared. Oh, for real? Yes. She didn't, She didn't, like, didn't even know this person, right? No, she had no connection. So it was just some random yes. unfortunate person. And so awful people <sighs> decided to knock on her door all the time. They would just show up at her house and be like, oh, can I come in and use your phone? And really, they were trying to get inside to talk to her about the story. Yep. And she didn't want to say anything because it's not her story to tell. Well, and she's probably already traumatized by somebody 
you know, banging on her door, originally telling her that her kids were just kidnapped. Right. And now she's got a bunch more people banging down her door all the damn time. Exactly. Like, quit bothering people like that. Even though she didn't want to talk about the story, the sheriff did request that she be interviewed for a segment that would be aired on America's Most Wanted. Okay. And Shirley did agree to this because she was actually hoping she could help prove Susan's innocence because she had heard all the recent chatter around town. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's sweet. It is. Investigators were still in the middle of rolling out their big master plan to get Susan to confess. The next day was to call all of the city's most influential ministers. They were asked to gather on the steps of the courthouse to make an emotional plea to the man that kidnapped the boys. There was also one more step to this plan. They were going to print up a newspaper that looked authentic. It would show a story about a young mother who killed her children, served a short sentence, was released, and married a wealthy physician. Oh, you like it? This is brilliant. Okay, and they took I'm on board. photos. Yeah, so they took photos of a police woman that Susan did not know, and they used that for the newspaper story. And of course, figured that it might get Susan to confess if she right. felt Sees like there was like hope. a short, yeah, yeah, like a you know, short afterwards. sentence. Yep, that makes that actually, that's honestly that mm-hmm. is brilliant. I know, like. Especially when you are in a high stress situation like she has put herself into. Right. And like, I feel like some little thing like that could be exactly what you need. Yeah. No, I, when I was reading this, I was like, shut. That's up. amazing. Yeah. Well, the newspaper idea wasn't used. The story never aired on America's Most Wanted, and the ministers who gathered at the courthouse didn't have the opportunity to make their plea. What? Later in the day, Susan met with police behind the local church, and she broke down. Holy shit! Yeah. Okay. All right. And this was on November 3rd. She begged Sheriff Wells for his gun, said that her children were not all right, and she fell to the floor crying. Investigators didn't reveal what they said to Susan that afternoon, but she was ready to confess. The police wanted oh, to make is, sure. What? Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is happening. Okay, this just like took. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Honestly, I will say before we get into this, I really would have liked to see how uh, their big master plan played out. I really it was good. Was looking forward to it. To be completely honest. Yeah. With you. But I'm glad she confessed. No, I am too. I just um, I did. Oh, yeah, that really took me off guard. I didn't really expect that. <laughs> yeah. The police wanted to make sure that they got something in writing, you know, for what they could use yep. uh, without making her confrontational. She explained that she was suicidal on the night of the murder. She said she was living in a veil of tears and didn't want her children to live without a mother. She planned to take her own life and kill her children at the same time. She remembers driving around town for an hour, then pulled off on the access road for the lake and let her car roll down the boat ramp, but then stopped it by pulling the emergency brake. She sat in the car, motionless, clutching the steering wheel. And then just decided to kill her own fucking children. Mm Mm-hmm. Sorry. (laughs) I'm so mad at this. It sucks. As she sat there, she heard the sound of her two children breathing as they were fast asleep in the back seat. Oh, that is even... Oh. hmm Yeah. After a while, she got out of the car, released the brake, and watched the car roll down the ramp and into the water. She filled two pages with her confession and drew little hearts when she used the word heart. Ew! Yeah, okay, that's just as off-putting to you yes Mm -hmm. i don't like that yeah like no i just don't even think she deserves to be able to do that like who the fuck do you think you are yeah and her confession said the following oh god is this gonna irritate me i just know i mean probably yeah When I left my home on Tuesday, October 25th, I was very emotionally distraught. I didn't want to live anymore. I felt like things could never get any worse. When I left home, I was going to ride around a little while and then go to my mom's. As I rode and rode and rode, 
I felt even more anxiety coming upon me without or about not wanting to live. I felt I couldn't be a good mom anymore, but I didn't want my children to grow up without a mom. I felt I had to end our lives to protect us from any grief or harm. I had never felt so lonely and so sad in my entire life. I was in love with someone very much, but he didn't love me and never would. I had a very difficult time accepting that, but I had hurt him very much and I could see why he could never love me. When I was at John D. Long Lake, I had never felt so scared and unsure as I did then. I wanted to end my life so bad and was in my car ready to go down that ramp into the water and I did go part way, but I stopped. I went again and stopped. I then got out of the car and stood by the car a nervous wreck. Why was I feeling this? Why was everything so bad in my life? I had no answers to these questions. I dropped to the lowest point when I allowed my children to go down that ramp into the water without me. I took off running and screaming, Oh God, oh God, no, what have I done? Why did you let this happen? I wanted to turn around so bad and go back, but I knew it was too late. I was an absolute mental case. I couldn't believe what I had done. I love my children with all my heart, and that will never change. I have prayed to them for forgiveness and hope that they will find it in their hearts to forgive me. I never meant to hurt them. I'm so sorry for what has happened, and I know that I need some help. I don't think I'll ever be able to forgive myself for what I've done. My children, Michael and Alex, are with our Heavenly Father now, and I know that they will never be hurt again. As a mom, that means more than words can ever say. I knew from day one the truth would prevail, but I was so scared that I didn't know what to do. It was very tough emotionally to sit and watch my family hurt like they did. It was time to bring a peace of mind to everyone, including myself. My children deserve to have the best, and now they will. I broke down on Thursday, November 3rd, and told Sheriff Howard Wells the truth. It wasn't easy, but after the truth was out, I felt like the world was lifted off my shoulders. I know now that it's going to be a tough and long road ahead of me. At this very moment, I don't feel like I was able to handle what's coming, but I have prayed to God that he give me the strength to survive each day and to face those times and situations in my life that'll be extremely painful. I have put my total faith in God, and he will take care of me. Susan V. Smith, 11394, 5.05 p.m. Go. I got you to, you're just like watching me like it's just building up over here. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay, first off. <laughs> how dare she try to blame heartbreak? Right. But we have all had our hearts broken. See, that's exactly why people tried to pin it on Tom Finlay yeah. and his letter is because of her words. And that is such bullshit. Yeah. No, no. You don't get to blame you being a disgusting human being and killing your own children on someone breaking your heart. Get over it like everybody else has to in the universe. Like, no, I hate that he, I, I just hate that she immediately blames him. Second, I'm pretty sure your kids would have liked to grow up. Yeah, and not, of course. I, I mean, they would have, they could grow up without a mother. People do it all but the time. they would have grown up. Yeah. And been alive and been able to live. I'm pretty sure they would have rather grow up without a mother. Well, and I hate how she's like, oh, they won't be in pain anymore. Yeah. And it's like, okay. are you kidding? Because you let your sleeping freaking babies go into the water and yeah. let them die in front of you. Mm-hmm. Oh! I know. Um, yeah. Everything about that was just... Gross. This case is awful. And like, oh, I was gonna kill myself and then kill them. No. As if that's if you, supposed to make it right, better. If you really like were gonna do something like that, I'm sorry, but kill yourself. Leave the fucking kids alone. Leave the kids alone. Yeah, it's not their choice. Drop them at your parents' house, drop them at a friend's house. I don't care. Yeah. That is not fair. Mm -hmm. That was not their choice. That is not what those kids wanted. No. And I thought it was absolutely disgusting, too. All of the words that she wrote, I'm just like, no. Oh, I love them so much. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure you freaking do. Because anybody that loves their children could never, like, 
And and what really bothers me, like, on top of everything else, is that she watched the vehicle roll into the water. Oh, and I'm going to give you an estimation soon of how long she watched and how long it took. No. And you're not going to like it. No, I'm not. Okay. So, obviously, Susan is saying that her car and children were at the bottom of John D. Long Lake. So Sheriff Wells went to the lake and told the divers that the car rolled in. It had not been driven fast like they originally assumed. Divers did locate the car 122 feet from the shore, upside down, under 18 feet of water. It wasn't a surprise that the car was flipped because as an object sinks, the heaviest part goes first. And in this case, that's the engine. Okay, I'm just warning you. This next part is so bad, okay? okay? The lake was dark and murky. No! Okay. But through the beam of a diver's flashlight, they could see... No! No, 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 no! Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, I'm freaking out. I'm freaking out! I'm freaking out! Yeah. They could see a small hand pressed against the window. Stop! Oh, no, 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 no. Mm Mm-mm. And... Mm, No, no, no. When the divers emerged, they were all crying. I'm about to cry. Yeah. The Mazda was slowly dragged up, and Steve Morrow and Francis Mitchum had to hold on to the sides of the car to make sure the doors or windows didn't open up. It took about 45 minutes for the car to be pulled out and flipped right side up. Tears rolled down everybody's faces as the bodies of Michael and Alex were unbuckled from their car seats. Oh, my God. (sighs) And they were carried to an ambulance. When a reporter asked Sheriff Wells about this, all he could say was, quote, We had a plan. The plan was carried out. And everyone there saw what was there. We all saw what we saw. And everyone is scarred for life. Yeah. When you look up the path that Susan took to get to the lake that night, she drove past the Winn-Dixie supermarket where her husband, David, was working as an assistant manager. She passed the road that led to the daycare center. He was working, so there was many places she could have dropped these kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. She went by the factory that she worked at, and she wasn't far from her mother and stepfather's home or her brother's home. She could have stopped at any of those places. So many. And chose not to. That night, after the confession, Sheriff Wells made an announcement. He said, quote, I have a brief statement to make. When I'm finished, there will be no questions asked and none answered. Susan Smith has been arrested and charged with two counts of murder in connection with the deaths of her children, Michael, three, and Alex, 14 months. Late this afternoon, a car was located in John D. Long Lake. Two bodies were found in the vehicle's back seat. Mrs. Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murders. Uh, A murder identities are still pending. Now, some people in the crowd started shouting and debating the racial injustices because Susan said a black man took her kids. I'm sorry, that's what they're concerned about? Well, it started a problem here. It, but like, it, I get it. Gets it. Better. Like, it gets better. Yeah, no, I get things like that is down. obviously a concern, yeah. but like, she just mm-hmm. murdered two children. Right. Let's focus on that for a yeah. few. Um, it's been said that Sheriff Wells did a great job of handling this and shutting it down. Good. The community's ministers preached a message of healing, not division. The night after the confession, the people of Union had a town meeting to pledge their desire for unity in the face of tragedy. Yes. They followed the meeting with a prayer vigil, and there were more than 100 people, both black and white. They all came together. They were determined to send a message to the nation that their city would not be racially divided. I have goosebumps everywhere right now. (laughs) In fact, the communities had forged stronger ties, and Susan's brother, Scotty, issued an apology in a letter he read to the media to apologize for the racial issues that Susan caused. Susan's husband, David, said that he immediately felt hollow and betrayed. He had no idea Susan was behind this whole thing. Well, now, how do you even come back from that? Not only do you lose your children, but, like, also your wife because... She betrayed you on every possible level. Yeah, you're not going to want to ever... 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, he literally is like losing everything he's known. And that's just, yeah, that's awful. Right. And he believed her until the end and would have gladly taken those boys if she didn't want them. I'm sure he would have. When David got his own apartment, he started setting up a room for the boys so that they would feel like it was their home, too. Oh, no. Yeah, he wanted them. South Carolina decided to pursue the death penalty against Susan, but her defense attorney said it made no sense because Susan wanted to die. They said the worst punishment she should face is having to live every day with what she did. On November 6, 1994, Michael and Alex were laid to rest. Get ready. I'm not. Together in the same casket. The yellow ribbons that had been placed on the mailboxes and light posts were replaced with blue and white ones as a remembrance for the boys. More than a thousand people showed up for the funeral visitation, and it's estimated that about 700 gifts of flowers were delivered, including one from President Bill Clinton. Wow. Mm hmm. This was huge. That made it far. The boat ramp at John D. Long Lake was transformed into a shrine for the boys, and it was covered in flowers, stuffed animals, balloons, pictures, and crosses. Oh, That's so sweet. Mm hmm. On November 22nd, two weeks after the funeral, David filed a countersuit in his divorce from Susan. He asked for a divorce on the grounds of adultery. He has also asked for the return of the Mazda. In the counterclaim, his lawyer stated, quote, The minor children are now deceased due to very tragic circumstances. The issues of custody, visitation, and child support are therefore moot. The children of the plaintiff and defendant were tragically killed in the automobile, and the plaintiff believed that he should be entitled to exclusive title control and possession of this automobile so that he can see that the same is properly disposed of. Holy cow. On December 12th, Susan was indicted on two charges of murder. The media coverage had been so intense on this case, and people were not sure if they could find anybody for the jury that could be fair. Instead of having the trial move to another location, the defense attorney, David Bruck, decided to stay local and thought that this would actually work in Susan's favor. So he said that the prosecution was painting Susan as a non-human or like a character full of evilness. And if he got a jury full of people in another area, it's really easy for them to believe that she's evil. But if the jury grew up in the same area as Susan, it's more difficult because who knew her. Yeah. And like, who can believe that they were raised near a human that awful and didn't notice anything? So interesting move. The jurors were chosen nine men, three women. Four jurors were black and eight were white. The prosecution pulled a move that many people say was a huge mistake during the trial. They attempted to prove why Susan murdered her children, even though the law didn't say they needed a motive. It was argued that Susan got rid of her kids in an attempt to win back her boyfriend, Tom Finley. He was wealthy, lived in his family's mansion. And because he said he didn't want to raise the kids. Yep. And he worked at his father's company. And he was the most eligible bachelor, you know? He would have provided a better life for Susan. And again, in that letter, you know, he outlined that it wasn't anything against the kids themselves. Like, let's just make that clear. Some people just don't want kids. That's totally fine. And that's exactly it. But the prosecution didn't need to prove the motive. South Carolina law says they only need to prove that it was premeditated by a mere second. Ooh. Susan already provided that information in her confession when she said she was driving down the boat ramp and stopped and put the emergency brake on. She gave herself time to think about her actions. The reason it's a mistake for the prosecution to provide a motive when it's not necessary to win is because then it gives the defense the opportunity to provide their theory. Oh, I didn't think of that. Yeah, I suppose that makes right. sense. Because when I was reading this initially, I was like, why do they keep talking about this? Yeah. Who cares if they provide a motive? But, oh, that. 
they were able to say she wasn't actually evil. She was a loving mom that was immature, and they argued that the murders of Michael and Alex was a botched attempt of Susan trying to end her own life. Okay. Well, it puts Com- doubt in people's minds. Completely botched attempt when she literally undid the parking brake and let it go and mm-hmm. watched it. Yeah. Well, and it kind of works for them because Susan had that past history of being suicidal. Yup. And was even briefly hospitalized for that. Also, her father took his own life when she was six, which puts Susan at a higher risk for taking her life as well. Yep. She did suffer from depression, and there were accusations that she was sexually abused by her stepfather, which started when she was 15, and the most recent abuse by him was allegedly three months prior to the murders. All of these extra facts would not have been allowed in the trial if the prosecution didn't try to prove the motive. Right. It immediately made the case more complex by adding in, you know, like how suicidal she is, especially when they're seeking the death penalty. Right, right. Since the defense brought up the allegations of Susan's abusive past and it was determined that it made her suicidal but not mentally ill, the prosecution was not allowed to have their own psychiatrist evaluate her. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so this whole thing is like... Oh, my. Yeah. She was found guilty of two counts of murder, and the next phase of trial would be figuring out the punishment. The prosecution put together a video to show what would happen if a car like Susan's was dropped into the lake. So you see the car rolling down the ramp and entering the water. It was taped from the shore, and another camera was inside the car where the boys would have been sitting. Okay. The reason this was recreated was to show how long it would actually take in the movie. And how much time she has to, like, to run out to, there and actually help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, in the movies, a car might sink directly to the bottom in seconds. Yep. But that's not what happened when it went down the boat ramp. It floated for a while. And then the front started to slowly sink first. And they were able to see how the car would have filled with water and then trapped the boys inside. The defense asked the judge to not allow the video to be seen by the jury. They argued that the video was done in the daylight and there were divers next to the car, which gives a full sense of rescue that Susan would not have had in the dark all by herself. Uh, That that's ridiculous, honestly. Correct. Judge William Howard said he reviewed the video and determined it was relevant. The camera inside the car provided the most information because you can see how slowly the water was rising. This shows that Susan did have time to stop things. It took almost six minutes for the water to reach the interior camera. (sighs) And the car just bobbed around in the water. The boys' father, David, gave a testimony about all the things he used to do with the kids, such as taking them to the park to play. It's been said that there wasn't a dry eye at the end of what he said. The prosecutor, Tommy Pope, said he actually went to David and apologized for what he had to do, and Susan whispered an apology to David, and that made him so angry. Susan's stepfather was called to the stand for the abuse allegations, and he actually confirmed that they were true. Whoa. And took part of the blame for her actions. Whoa. Yeah. Well, that's a twist. Right, because honestly, when I was reading it, I was like, is this real? Right, just because there's been a lot of things said that She's weren't real. She's lied a lot. On July 28th, after only two and a half hours of deliberation, the jury unanimously voted to sentence Susan to life in prison. She was sent to the Women's Correctional Center in South Carolina, and she's eligible for parole after serving 30 years. What? Yeah. What? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't get it either. A few years... Okay, now this is where things are going to get real weird for you, because that was going to be the original ending, right there. Okay. But then I found a little nugget that I couldn't leave. Okay. A few years after Susan drowned her children in John D. Longlake, another tragedy happened in the exact same spot. What? 
Uh Uh-huh. In September of 1996, a group of 10 people, including six children, drove to the shore in a van. They were there to see the memorials for Michael and Alex Smith. No. They stopped the van, and some of them got out. The van, which had transmission problems, ended up rolling down the same boat ramp that Susan sent her kids down. Oh, my God. It passed between the memorial markers and knocked over a tree planted in memory of the Smith boys. There was one adult and four children inside the vehicle. Two adults dove into the lake to help and were able to free some of the kids from the vehicle, but it was too late. Oh, my God. The adults that dove in drowned with everybody that was trapped inside. What? Yeah. The bodies were pulled out by the same divers that pulled Alex and Michael from the lake. What? The van incident was ruled accidental. Uh, but I do want to read the names of the people that died in this one, too. And that was, like, you said that was in 96? Is that what you said? Yes. So that was only, like, two years later? Uh, yeah, yeah. Two years later. Wow. So. This poor town. Right. And then, okay, here are the names of the people that died in the van incident. Okay. So Tim Phillips, 26, and his wife, Angie, 22. Their kids, Courtney, 4, Melina, 1, and 4-month-old, Kinsley, also killed were Carl White, 29, and three-year-old Austin Rudwitz. So, wait, how many of them passed? Seven out of ten, correct? Yeah, so a group of ten people and, I mean, showed up there. And it's so awful that they showed up to actually see the, the memorial. memorial. And not only that, but the fact that they tried, like, others went down with it. They were, like, not even in there, but they were trying to help. Yeah. That is just so awful. Right. And soon after the accidental drownings, the Weekly World News published an article that says an ancient Indian curse was responsible for the deaths and the lake was haunted. The article explained that the local Yamasee Indians say the lake is inhabited by an evil spirit with the power to draw humans to their deaths. Well, then it is. Well, however... I couldn't find anything. I searched and searched and searched and searched, and I can only find this one thing where they posted it, so I kind of don't think it's real. It might not be. Okay, got it. Some visitors claim that they hear the sounds of children laughing or a baby crying when they go there, and they say that there's also been sightings of orbs dancing across the lake. However, the locals say it's not true. Okay. So I'm. I was. Gonna, I, I honestly wouldn't doubt like the um unfortunately like the baby crying situation though because that right. energy is left behind. Yeah. When that's such an intense situation. Yeah. But like, yeah, that is just this. Yeah. And it's possible it that awful. it is haunted, and the locals don't want to have anything to do with this story. You know I what sure I mean? as hell wouldn't. Because it's so awful. They knew the kids. Yeah, I wouldn't want anything to do with it. No. Uh. But yeah, I I tried. So if anybody out there happens to find, like, a real legend of this, send it our way. Yeah. But otherwise, I couldn't find it. All right. So there you go. Wowza. Yeah. That was, um, that was rough. Yes. That was a freaking doozy. Surprise ending. (laughs) I'm, yeah. Yeah, and it wasn't a great one. (laughs) No, it was not. It was a terrible ending. So. Because a ton um, more people died. This is one of those stories where I, like, don't even want to talk about it at the end. Oh, you're done already? (laughs) Because I hated it so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. That just, that was, everything about that was awful. I I know. um, I did not. Yeah, I'm done. (laughs) Well, there you have it. (laughs) I'm done. (laughs) Okay. All right. So make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, bye. Bye.